All right. I have a little bit after 10 o'clock. Um, so uh, we may have a few uh, arrivals still straggling in. But uh, let me go ahead and uh, call our panel discussion to order. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, thanks to Chantal and Jess for organizing and promoting this event. As you all uh, probably know, this is uh, one of a continuing series of um, panel discussions uh, hosted by the Science Circle um, with various topics. Uh, this um, session will be recorded and available on YouTube in a day or two. And you can also find uh, an archive of our past panel discussions on the Science Circle YouTube channel or through the Science Circle website. Uh, today, I'm kind of uh, uh, um, pleased to have a little bit more of a cheerful topic, I'm hoping, uh, than last week, or I should say last month, when we discussed <laughs> the mass extinctions, which was pretty depressing. Uh, this uh, today we're going to uh, look at recent breakthroughs um, in uh, medical therapies or treatments for sort of previously intractable diseases. Uh, this was prompt. This idea was prompted by a report I heard on NPR a month or so ago, um, where. Uh, Anthony Fauci actually was interviewed on NPR, and it's kind of rare that uh, that uh, a medical breakthrough is uh, significant enough that he personally would promote it uh, publicly. Uh, and this is a new therapy for cystic fibrosis, um, which is a rare um, ailment uh, affecting the where the lungs uh, become filled with. Uh, fibrous um, gunk and making it very difficult to breathe. Um, it's a genetic disease and is um, usually condemns um, the afflicted to a short life. Uh, maybe they're like lucky to live into their mid twenties, I think. And um, my cousin's son has cystic fibrosis. So this really, uh, this new announcement really popped out at me. Uh, so let me uh, actually sort of start with a little discussion of this new breakthrough on cystic fibrosis. Um, the Cystic Fibrosis uh, uh, Foundation has uh, published a press release. Today marks a tremendous breakthrough and exciting news for people with cystic fibrosis. The US Food and Drug Administration approved Trichofta for people with cystic fibrosis who have, who have at least one copy of the F58 DEL mutation. With the approval of tr Trichofta, more than 90% of people with CF could eventually have a highly effective therapy for the underlying cause of the disease. Until now, most people with a single copy of the mutation did not have an approved treatment for the underlying cause of CF. <clears throat> Clinical trials of Trichofta showed, a dramatic, showed dramatic improvements in key measures of the disease. Um, people with two copies of the mutation had a 10% increase in lung function uh, compared to treatment with the uh, modulator. And um, people with one copy had more than a 14% to placebo. Um, uh, Trichofta is apparently a kind of a cocktail drug of three other drugs. Uh, so this kind of reminds me a little bit of, uh, um, we're increasingly seeing these kinds of medications uh, similar to what we have with a the AIDS cocktail and so um, and I should mention that the drug comes with warnings related to elevated liver function test, uh, drug drug interactions, um, and um, uh, liver enzyme complications. Also, risk of cataracts. Um, so 
So that was uh, that was the news that sort of prompted this topic. Um, so I also wanted to, in order to um, kind of expand it out a little bit, I've invited um, a couple of our favorite um, uh, medical and biology people to help me discuss uh, these breakthroughs. Um, uh, I have with us um, a tagline, uh, Ro Dr. Robert Hendricks, who has presented here at the Science Circle. I think we're all familiar with uh, with Robert and also uh, Stephen uh, Geyser. Um, and they will each discuss uh, different aspects of breakthroughs. I, I believe that uh, uh, Stephen is going to give us an update on uh, CRISPR uh, in, cl in clinical trials and um, uh, other potentials for the use of CRISPR. And uh, uh, Tagline wants to, um, uh, Dr. Hendricks wants to uh, uh, talk to us a little bit about um, interesting new technologies, uh, medical technologies that are on there. Um, before we get started with that, though, I also <laughs> wanted to share a couple of un other interesting uh, just medical breakthroughs um, uh, on other topics. Uh, just bear with me here a little bit while I pull this up. Um, I don't want to do that one yet. Here we go. Oh, so um, one other uh, interesting topic is migraines. Um, more than one in 10 Americans deal with migraines. Uh, they, um, uh, 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 there is now a new drug that may help. Food and Drug Administration recently approved Rivo, Revo, to treat acute migraine, the drug is active for short-term migraine, isn't intended to prevent migraine. The drug treats migraine with or without aura, a common sensory phenomenon or visual disturbance that can accompany migraines. Um, it was tested in two randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trials. Um, uh, um, it has been characterized um, as a significant breakthrough because it's a new class of medi medi medications known as ditans. This kind of medication works similar to another type of medication called triptans, a class of medications to treat migraine that came out of the 1990s and helped, excuse me, helped with acute migraine. But triptans narrowly uh, narrowed blood vessels. So they weren't a good choice for patients with cardiac or stroke risk factors. Common types of triptans include Emetrix, Domig, and Maxalt. Uh, experts say that ditans work similarly to triptans, but do not have the cardiovascular effects. This will allow us to use it for people with migraine who cannot take triptans due to concerns for stroke or heart attack. Um, uh, the, um, uh, this class of drugs has been called a game changer because it works on different receptors than triptans. Um, also, uh, many patients do not respond to triptans, so this will be an additional option. Um, so, um, uh, so I thought uh, I wanted to bring that to your attention as well. Um, and then uh, also I wanted to mention some breakthroughs in multiple sclerosis. Um, uh, there has been an important discovery uh, now, you may know that multiple sclerosis is a muscle degenerative disease um, that is uh, chronic and progressive. Uh, it's an autoimmune disease, apparently, similar to psoriasis or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, researchers at Trinity College in Dublin um, have identified a molecule known as IL-17, which is involved in priming cells that cause multiple sclerosis. Rather than being directly involved in damaging the nervous system, IL-17 kickstarts the disease-causing immune response that mediates the damage, they believe. And they have recently published work um, uh, uh, suggesting there is significant potential for drugs that target the IL-17 molecule. Uh, MS is a debilitating disease that affects some 2 to 3 million people globally and over 9,000 people in Ireland, for whatever that's worth. This is a report from Ireland, so um, it's, infiltrated, it's associated with the infiltration of immune cells into the brain and spinal cord 
that cause damage to nerves leading to neurological disability. Oh, so I, uh, I'm corrected. It's not a muscle degenerative, nerve degenerative. Um, uh, so early clinical trials with antibody-based drugs that blocked IL-17 are showing promise in the treatment of relapsing remitting MS and have already been licensed for treatment uh, of psoriasis. Uh, so, um, yeah, yes, uh, thank you, Syzygy. It is a neuro disease. My bad on that one. Um, uh, but that, uh, uh, but that sounds promising. And, and MS is a really um, devastating uh, disease, um, and it's very interesting that they're able to identify uh, some significant molecules. Uh, that appear to trigger it, and then uh, as a, a typical strategy when you do that is to then uh, create antibodies against that molecule so that you can bind up that molecule uh, in your body uh, so that it can't uh, bind to its receptors and so forth. That's a very typical strategy. Um, yeah, I was a little bit surprised to uh, to read that uh, it can infiltrate into the brain. That's kind of terrifying. Um, so with that sort of introduction into what uh, prompted me to uh, present this topic, uh, I'd like to now uh, invite my guests to uh, chime in. And uh, I guess if... Uh, 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 it might be, let's, um, uh, Stephen, if you're prepared to talk, why don't we get um, a little bit of an update on the status of CRISPR, which I, is always a sexy topic, and we're always curious to know what, uh, what updates are available for CRISPR. So um, please feel free to uh, take the mic. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, Baragon. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, CRISPR is always sexy. And the reason it is, is it really opens up new avenues for thinking about the microbiology, how we understand diseases, as well as ways we can think about creatively to treat them in a, in a way that's not just drugs or trying to uh, blast the body with some sort of effect and hope that it preferentially affects the disease as compared to healthy tissues. And it really is something where you can think about permanent solutions for a person's disease because you just change the DNA of cells in people in order to, uh, to correct or to alleviate some sort of pathology. So, you know, when we were first um, talking about this, I just picked a subset of diseases that we had discussed. And to illustrate really different ways in which CRISPR-Cas9 can be thought about as a way to study disease and as a therapeutic. And so I actually found three kind of interesting aspects or stages of development that, um, that scientists and um, companies are thinking about CRISPR-Cas9. So I do want to give just one brief two-minute reintroduction to what CRISPR-Cas9 is. And this is essentially an enzyme that comes from bacteria. A lot of bacteria have them actually. And it has the basic feature and property that the protein, when complex with an RNA molecule, and RNA are the messenger types of, of molecules in the cell that come from DNA, that when complex with this will actually find a corresponding specific sequence of DNA in the genome, and then it'll cut it. And that's what's being demonstrated in this picture here is the yellow is the RNA, the orange blob is the protein, and that yellow is specifically finding that blue sequence, and that blue sequence allows the orange to create have these molecular scissors that cut the DNA. And I'm not going to talk, again, you can look at prior talks I've given about CRISPR, or you can look at YouTube online to talk about, or to kind of understand a little bit more all the things it can and can't do. But, uh, and I'll talk about some of those specifics for the different diseases, but the key thing, the key thing that's amazing is that you can basically target any sequence in a cell you want and then try and affect different types of changes. And that's what's really amazing about the technology. Now, bacteria use it as an immune system, a way to try and fend off 
uh, DNA or RNA based viruses. And then there are some other like other ways that they, they fight each other as bacteria. But that being said, uh, something I've talked about in my, um, oh, sorry, let me say in general, you can actually think about CRISPR-Cas9 as being involved in different stages of the development of how we understand a disease. And that while I think it's important to think about it as a therapeutic, it's actually, uh, there are other stages of science in which this has become an incredibly powerful new tool. And again, I, oh, sorry, I didn't mention that. You know, CRISPR-Cas9 as a technology has only been around since 2012. And in terms of it accelerating very quickly into the lab, and it's a therapeutics, it's actually a very amazing and fast and rapid development cycle. So, you know, in addition to thinking about CRISPR-Cas9 as a therapeutic, again, targeting cells, changing genes, doing things, how CRISPR-Cas9 is used in the lab is that you can actually start mimicking the types of mutations that we know cause disease in tissue culture, in cells you can study, or in whole animals or model organisms, or even like subsets of tissues. And the ability to directly recreate mutations that we know lead to disease, and then to study those in the lab, in these model systems, is incredibly powerful. The other thing you can do with Cas9, again, this is a somewhat similar technology have existed before, is you can mutate or otherwise affect cells that you're working with in the lab to just discover how your disease gene interacts with other genes. And in some cases, and I'll talk about an example of this at the end, where you can find other genes that when you overexpress them, alleviate the, to the toxicity of the pathology protein. And this is the type of idea where, again, if you didn't have the ability to really mass screen and mutagenize lots of things at, at the same time, then, uh, my clothes are dry, by the way, then, um, you know, it's an incredibly powerful discovery tool. And then, The other thing, and I just want to be, you know, it's this technology is accelerated very quickly, but the translation of it into an actual therapeutic is still a big hurdle that we have in the, um, in how we think about these as therapeutics. And so there are some limited applications that we have right now. I don't really want to go into that. That would be a time for a better talk, but just one thing to keep in mind that for the last couple of decades, we've had recombinant DNA technology, and there's still this challenge of how do you get your packages into the right cells in the right amount, and then also not elicit immune responses from the target tissues. So we're still uh, trying to overcome some of those hurdles, but again, depending on the disease, like for example, there's a lot of early work that's being done in eye diseases. And the reason eye diseases are very nice to work with is that there's no immune system response in most cases when you deliver you know, viruses. So it's actually one of those interesting aspects. Uh, the other very last exciting thing is that um, there's a new paper that came out that I talked about in uh, my CRISPR year in review. And the, um, the thing about it is that it actually creates a very different, more precise way that we can fix DNA and make changes in the targets. And so you know, this is something that it's so new, people are still taking some time to really um, adapt it and how we might think about it in terms of um, therapeutics. But I think one thing is, as I go through the talk, you'll see how, if you could just imagine being a little bit more precise in how you change DNA, you can actually accomplish even uh, more interesting things. So the first disease I'll talk about, and this is one of the ones where at its stage right now, is just actually in clinical trials. And so the disease here is something people Again, taking basic biology, or you hear about it on the news, is sickle cell anemia or beta thalassemia. And these are caused by defects in how red blood cells uh, interact with DNA and travel through the body. And the key things about it is it's modifying uh, hemoglobin, and hemoglobin is the actual protein complex that binds oxygen. And when that's defective, you have one, poor oxygen delivery to tissues. But then specifically in the case of sickle cell anemia, it causes the red blood cells to, to not be very flexible and to get point, pointy edges. And that can actually block up capillaries and lead to a lot of pain and other crises when you are in a low oxygen situation. Again, in, without medical intervention, people that are homozygous recessive for sickle cell anemia usually die before the age of 10. 
And one thing that's important to, to recognize in this context, in terms of how we, our bodies deal with oxygen, is that if you are an embryo, a zygote growing inside your mother's womb, you need to be able to be better at grabbing oxygen from her bloodstream than her other tissues. And there's this, I, there's this um, modification of hemoglobin known as gamma hemoglobin. And this is essentially something that we only express as babies, because it's not as good as regular hemoglobin for oxygen delivery in an adult. But in terms of that situation being in the womb, it's much, it's very good at capturing oxygen from, from, the, from the mother. And what has been known from the literature for a long time is that there are people who have beta thalassemia, so they're defective in um, their ability to transport oxygen with a mature hemoglobin, but they have an overexpressed amount of the fetal hemoglobin, the gamma hemoglobin. And this is what the chart is showing here, is that as you go towards the left, that's the symptoms. On the x-axis, that is the um, amount of expression you have of gamma hemoglobin. And then the y-axis, the higher you go, the less, um, or that's the degree of symptoms that you have. And so as you go to the right, where you have more gamma hemoglobin, then you actually have less symptoms of beta thalassemia. And so the exciting thing about this is that, again, from the literature and what I'm showing here in the lower lower panel, is some work showing that there are a variety of deletions that have been found in human populations that allow gamma hemoglobin to be expressed in adults. And what the therapeutics coming from um, Vertex and in a combination with CRISPR therapeutics, they actually are in phase one clinical trials of trying to recreate these deletions with Cas9 and doing this in patients' blood cells, express gamma hemoglobin, alleviate sickle cell anemia or beta thalassemia. And so, you know, one of the, the key things about this, this is very exciting, right? This is something, a nice body of science that tells us how a disease works, how we can alleviate the disease. And then CRISPR Cas9 allows us to recreate that situation. Now, this is a somewhat limited type of effect in that CRISPR-Cas9 is coming in and actually trying to purposely delete DNA in the target cells. So we're not trying to do something very precise. Uh, we're not trying to do something that's, you know, this very subtle ways of affecting DNA. We're just, boom, trying to chop out a piece that allows the expression to happen. And, you know, more details about how that works in particular, but I think the emphasis I want to make is that CRISPR-Cas9 is something where if you have a situation where deleting fra fragments of DNA allows you to fix a disease, we can do that. And this is in clinical trials and it's showing some uh, effectiveness. So um, I'm glad I put this next slide in. I'm going to switch gears to a different disease, cystic fibrosis, which is something that um, Baragon was mentioning at the beginning. And the basic problem with cystic fibrosis, and the cystic fibrosis, I don't know, I don't know if there are any books where people have just focused on how that particular disease and gene and the genetics has helped us as a field understand, you know, genes and pathologies, but it's an amazing story. It's been around for a very, like, decades. And what we know is that it has this failure to move chloride ions across membranes. And the reason it doesn't do this is one of two reasons, is that the protein is either A, not present on the cell membrane where it needs to do its action, right? If you're gonna push something across the cell membrane, you need to be at the cell membrane. Or there are the catalytic parts that are binding uh, other proteins or binding the chloride, and those just aren't working very well. Now, if you look at this chart, what we're actually looking at is the structure of, of the gene. It has a lot of exons, has lots of component parts. And then its actual protein has lots of different domains and things that are happening. And so, uh, actually, yeah, let me, CB asked a good question in, in local chat, is that why is sickle cell anemia, why is it such an issue? Is that if you have, if you're heterozygous for the mutation that causes sickle cell anemia, it's been shown you have a little bit of resistance to malaria. And so malaria is a bigger issue in terms of survival than having rare numbers of people die from being homozygous recessive. So that's kind of the dynamics in terms of evolution as well as interaction with uh, parasites. Okay, but again, get, and cystic fibrosis is actually an interesting story too. Actually, you know, that brings up a really good point. And I know you mentioned the context of why cystic fibrosis 
it is highly prevalent as a mutation in Caucasian populations is that it's believed, the best theory right now, is that it's protective against diarrhea. That it, one reason that things like cholera actually kill you is they make you push a lot of chloride ions from inside your body into your intestine, and that helps push more water into your intestines, and that's how you get diarrhea. And then the bacteria that are causing this to happen can then spread more easily, they get all over the place. And so if you have in def some degree of inefficiency, right, your heterozygous for the mutation, then you do that less efficiently, you retain more water and you can survive better against the disease. So again, coming back to the idea of, of evolution. Um, okay, but it's a complicated protein. And this is what's actually interesting about this in terms of therapeutics is that it's when you have a very complicated gene that has lots of things that's doing, the ability to do genome editing is somewhat less effective because it's going to be very hard to come up with one single way of dealing with, um, with those different mutations. Unless you can just go in and replace stuff, which is also very difficult with very big genes, you have to find very precise strategies. And so this review uh, coming from uh, Craig Hodges and Rob Onlin talks about how, as Baragon mentioned, there's a very specific, highly prevalent mutation, which is actually a deletion of a few genes, or sorry, a, a few amino acids in an important catalytic site. But then there's a lot of other mutations that are just one nucleotide change to another. And so, uh, and so then actually, the other, the other category, there are several that cause splicing to be different, so that the arrangement of exons and you're missing whole chunks of the protein and it doesn't work very well. And these all require, in essence, slightly different strategies in terms of genome editing to fix it. Now, one of the important advances we've had for CRISPR-Cas9 technology is, in contrast to trying to break DNA and then hope it fixes together in some way that is beneficial, there are these things called base editors. And this is where you come in with a deaminase that basically modifies DNA in a way that's just one base at a time, and then hopefully you just mutate it to a different one. And that's what I'm showing here under the, the picture on the right, is that we have the capacity right now with CRISPR-Cas9 and these what are called base editors, again, something developed by David Liu at Harvard, is to ch change a particular C to a T or an A to a G when we think about that top strand, or to change a G to an A or a T to a C in terms of just how we orient on that top strand. The other limitation, of course, also is that the spacing of this has to be correct when it comes to thinking about where Cas9 is binding. Again, remember, Cas9 can't bind any sequence in the genome. It's limited by what's called the PAM. And so you have to have a PAM in the right amount of distance to the base you're trying to edit for these things to actually be effective. And again, it doesn't always work precisely, and there can be background. So um, what was interesting is that the the main limitation that people are excited in developing methods of and showing in tissue culture models that they can fix cystic fibrosis. And I would say that the main limitation right now is trying to understand the best way to deliver this into tissue. Because lung tissue, on the one hand, we can adapt adenoviruses, which are something that actually infect lungs. We modify their genomes. They're, very, they're actually pretty good at getting into epithelial tissue. But those are the ones that also invoke strong immune responses. So. Um, it's, it's an interesting topic, but I think this the stage of this is that we have targets and we can uh, relatively efficiently modify them, but in terms of the delivery, it's not quite there yet. All right, and then the last gene that I want to talk about is uh, Parkinson's. So, um, actually, sorry, there are two, two more I'm going to talk about. So Parkinson's, uh, again, understanding the genetic causes of Parkinson's is something that's still not fully understood. So in term, in contrast to cystic fibrosis, where we can say, oh, here's a gene, here are the mutations, can we just fix these? We don't know that as well for Parkinson's disease. However, what has been shown in the pathology is that there's a protein known as alpha-synuclein that is associated with the pathology. And it's been shown in models that if you can help alleviate the aggregation of this protein, you can actually help um, alleviate or reduce the toxicity of, or the causative effects of Parkinson's disease. And so here's an interesting paper that came out. Again, this is very early studies looking at uh, tissue culture. This is actually done in yeast. This is the funny thing. But they call this method PRISM, and it stands for Perturbing Regulatory Interactions by Synthetic Modulators. 
And what they're actually doing specifically is taking CRISPR-Cas9 and saying, okay, you're not something that's going to cut DNA. But what you're going to do is land in your genes, and what you're going to do is turn the gene on. And so this, uh, try to turn a gene on, and then seeing how that affects what's happening in the rest of the cell, when you're specifically looking for, say, a toxicity phenotype, that's something we can do pretty well in yeast. And we can do this in a mass effect where, again, discovering what's out there. We don't know what we're going to get. We don't know if we'll get anything. But just see if some gene, by being overexpressed, can alleviate a toxicity. And so that's what's being shown here in this, um, this diagram from, from the lab. Again, this is only a couple years old. But they are just randomly trying to turn on lots of different genes in yeast and see if you can alleviate the phenotype of the alpha synuclein causing the yeast cells to die. So you're just looking for cells that survive. And what I think is really powerful about this, this type of approach is that if you can find things where just turning on the gene or a, a network that turns on a gene, that becomes your therapeutic target, right? You don't target the gene that's a pathology, you target something that interacts with it and helps alleviate it. And so this discovery work is pretty nice. And at least the stage at which this work was in 2017 was they showed that the genes that worked in yeast to alleviate the toxicity also the corresponding genes in mammalian cells can alleviate toxicity in mammalian cells. So again, not in patients, not in animal models, but very early cellular work. So I think that's really cool. I mean, it's, it really changes the approach you have to understanding how you can treat symptoms or disease. Okay, and then the last one I'll talk about, and this was when I was trying to look up CRISPR for uh, multiple sclerosis, I couldn't find anything. And again, multiple sclerosis is one of these, I think, multifactorial things in most cases. There's not a simple disease gene target that you can always fix. But as I was doing that, there's actually this uh, interesting related um, neurodegeneration. So it's something called progressive multifocal uh, leukoencephalopathy. So PML, and I'm going to refer to it as PML from now on. And what this is, is the activation and expression of a virus that almost all of us have, basically nine out of 10 of you that I'm looking at have, are infected with this virus. Now, most people with normal immune systems, it just is, lies dormant, doesn't affect us in terms of our biology. You don't even know it's there, right? Before I said this, you probably didn't even know this thing existed. And, but what happens in people that are immune compromised, like people who have uh, HIV and then undergo uh, later stages of that, but also people who are being treated for MS. So one thing is that when you think about multiple sclerosis, again, don't worry, Syzygy, I am not going to cause you to have the disease. But one thing that you do with MS is MS is an, um, an autoimmune disease. And so the treatment for it is to actually suppress your immune system. Well, the second you start suppressing your immune system, this is a secondary effect you can have where this thing gets reactivated and actually starts causing the myelin, uh, demyelination of, of neurons. So it's almost a um, kind of sad kind of effect that you can have in some cases. Now, what's really interesting about this, of course, is that the expression of this virus in cells doesn't benefit you at all. Sorry, it's not one of your genes. It's just a very easy target that as long as you can affect that those target viral genes, and not have bystander effects of human genes, you can use CRISPR-Cas9 to target it. And that's essentially what uh, Willebo et al. was showing in this recent paper, is that in tissue culture systems, if you express Cas9, again, something that's able to cut DNA, and you target specifically only a viral replication protein, or well, the gene that makes a protein, you can actually decrease the amount of infection you have in your tissue culture cells. And so, what I think is very interesting about this is as we think about a lot of different types of pathologies, things like hepatitis B has people started working on it, um, herpes simplex virus, and uh, there's another one that I'm now blanking on that they talked about. But the idea of, of trying to therapeutically treat viral infections to humans with CRISPR-Cas9, this is something that's also, I think, on the horizon and something relatively feasible because as long as you're not accidentally making breaks in human genes at the same time, you can, you can have a very specific target that otherwise doesn't affect the human host. So those are my examples. So again, this is very early, but also invokes the idea of, you know, we're not targeting human genes, we're targeting pathology genes as a way of CRISPR-Cas9 to work. So, yeah. 
any questions? That's fantastic. Um, uh, Stephen, if, uh, if we are targeting um, genetic diseases uh, um, that, that have a, a protective effect for something else, what's the strategy for, you know, preserving the protective effect? Um, uh, I was thinking for sickle cell anemia, um, you know, one strategy would be, well, we'll cure the sickle cell anemia, and then we'll make the uh, disease-carrying mosquitoes. Uh, uh, is that, is, well, what am I thinking of? What, what is the, I guess sickle cell is just genetic, so, um, uh, but, uh, oh, but, but it does protect against malaria, so we could um, uh, just make the disease-carrying, the malaria-carrying mosquitoes go extinct. <laughs> that would solve the problem, but uh, you know maybe that's a little bit facetious. But um, but is there any thought given to you know how to treat these diseases while preserving the protective effect that they grant? No. Oh, well, there are two things you could do. So one, you could try and fix the the genes that are defective in the tissues where it affects you as a pathology, but then still leave it as protective for. The, the types of cells that are important for resistant disease. And there's ways right. of thinking about tissue specificity. But I will say the examples we're thinking about, right? I mean, the treatment for cystic fibrosis, or sorry, the treatment for, um, say, uh, cholera infection. People have shown, this was, these were tests done by the Army on, uh, I think, young recruits, was just force them to drink lots of water. If you drink lots of water, cholera cannot kill you. It's only a matter of dehydration. And so when we think about malaria, we have anti-malarial drugs. Nets. Nets are a great way of reducing infection rates. And we actually are also, the scientific community are trying to find ways to, yeah, eradicate mosquito populations using CRISPR and gene drives. So, you know, cystic fibrosis, again, the, the protective effect of that is protected against bacteria. Well, we have lots of ways of protecting against bacteria. You get diagnosed early, you take penicillin. Um, you know, there are, the majority of the things that these genes are protective against are things that we have much better ways to treat. Um, we, we have other ways to think about how to, to manage those those diseases. That's fascinating. I um, My brother uh, last year um, was diagnosed with a very rare form of leukemia, which is caused by a genetic mutation that does not kick in until you're in your 60s, um, which is kind of spooky in, in and of itself it just lies dormant until you're basically until you're old and um uh and it is but it is a genetic it is caused by by a mutation and um so um of course the first thing i thought about um when we learned about this was well this sounds like a perfect target for crispr therapy and uh, he in fact he did talk to his doctor about that but um, but it, it's too often in the future. Um, although, maybe in five or six years, who knows? Um, so what they did do uh, was a more, I guess, more quote-unquote conventional therapy, which still strikes me as unbelievably science fiction. Um, he was treated at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston and had a stem cell transplant. That worked! Um... So, you know, so he had to go undergo massive chemotherapy to completely kill his bone marrow. And then he was um, transfused with, with, so his stem cells also were matched through the, um, uh, through a, a global registry. And his donor was some stranger from Greece. Can you believe that? So um, actually, one of our family members did have a match, uh, my older brother, but my older brother is in his 70s, and we felt was just too old to be a donor, basically. You, you Ideally, for these kind of things, you want, um, you know, young, um, uh, robust uh, stem cells. Anyway, the stem cell transplant worked, and um, he regrew his bone marrow with new, with, uh, um, with uh, and which generated new blood cells and immune cells that did not have the mutation. Um, now he does uh, so he's that was about um, almost a year ago now, and he does have a restored immune system, 
but it's weak. It probably will never be as robust as it was before the disease, but, you know, it's good enough. But this will probably keep him alive maybe until a CRISPR cure is available, maybe in five or ten years. Um, so it's all quite fascinating to me. These kind of rare diseases, I think, are a great target for therapies. Um, uh, uh, primarily because they are rare. They're sort of, you know, these rare, they're sort of a, um, I guess, a treatment of last resort, I would. Um, and that makes them, I think, valuable. And they, they're kind of like would be an orphan drug type. So, um, but the reason I mention this is just because that I remember when the notion of stem cells as therapeutic seemed unbelievably science fiction-y. Like back in the 1980s, um, I think stem cells were almost hypothetical about whether they even existed. And, um, and now, here, here they are, stem cell transplants are practically routine. It's unbelievable. So... Um, Anyway, so I just wanted to share that story. Uh, I think I think stem cell transplants are a really remarkable advance uh, for these, uh, especially for leukemias and so. Yeah, um, I'll just mention. Let me just yeah, follow up on that. Yeah, go ahead. In yeah, terms of CRISPR. That these types of things where you can extract people's blood cells, circulating cells, grow them up in the lab, do genetic manipulations, and then re-implant them back into the same patient. That really is one of the the best areas where you can start doing that type of work. And so that's where there is a lot more advancing, uh, I think for CRISPR-Cas9, because of that ability to take stuff out, grow it up more, put it back in. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and it's also remarkable to me that they can isolate stem cells from a donor's blood. You know, the transplant is, it's basically just a blood transfusion. It's like it's a, the actual pr procedure is simple once you can isolate the stem cells from the donor's blood and then grow up the stem cell population to a therapeutic amount. Um, okay, uh, let's uh, move on here a little bit. Uh, before I um, uh, yield to a tagline, uh, I wanted to mention another uh, interesting. Uh, uh, a breakthrough. Um, uh, this is related to Parkinson's, which we have also discussed. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, recently the FDA granted breakthrough device designation for uh, NQ Medical's NeuroQWERTY technology. And the reason this is kind of as a segue to what uh, a tagline is going to talk about. Um, uh, it says breakthrough device status is given to medical devices that have the potential to be an effective treatment or diagnostic tool for life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating diseases. Status speeds up the review and assessment of the process so the devices can reach faster. Um, the NeuroQWERTY software, software measures how fast a person is typing on a smart device and how much pressure they apply to each key. An artificial intelligence method called machine learning can detect small changes in the typing movements, which it can associate with different diseases such as Parkinson's. The software does not record the words that were typed, only the patterns associated with the typing action. And then it goes on to uh, uh, quote one of the founders of the company, everyone has a unique typing and touchscreen signature. Research has revealed that the way we interact with computers and mobile devices can reveal with startling accuracy the presence of certain neuromotor, neurocognitive, and neurobehavioral disorders. I just wanted to mention that because I find that fascinating, that, um, that uh, our, the way we interact with our devices has a signature. Um, uh, and with that, I will uh, use that as a segue for Tagline to tell us a little bit about uh, recent breakthroughs in um, medical technology. So take it away. A couple quick thoughts. Can you hear me? Yes. Let's see. Hello? You're able to hear me? Yes, I hear you. Oh, okay, good. 
uh, an immediate response I have to that uh, uh, is that if we can get a hold of uh, data from um, POTUS's cell phone, because I doubt he can type on a keyboard, maybe we can figure out what's wrong with him um, neurologically. Uh, there's a couple of points. Uh, one um, that occurred to me in terms of cystic fibrosis, um, one of the um, consequences sometimes, this is also known medically as mucoviscidosis, uh, which is sort of descriptive of the extremely viscous uh, um, mucus that tends to cause obstructions and damage to lungs and all sorts of uh, excretory systems, including pancreas and other organs. Um, uh, polyps, nasal polyps are not unusual. If you see children with nasal polyposis, that's considered medically to be cystic fibrosis until proven otherwise. And there have been uh, reports where the um, presence of nasal polyposis in children was uh, felt associated with um, variants in some of the genes associated with um, and gene dis disturbances associated with um, cystic fibrosis. Um, one of the other things that occurred to me was uh, when I was at University of Pennsylvania, I knew a fellow who was really brilliant uh, named um, Dr. Dick Doty. He was um, an old, uh, big in olfaction. He, he was um, one of the developers of one of the first olfactometers, or ways of measuring olfactory function um, reliably, which is extremely difficult. At any rate, he used to talk about how so many of these degenerative neurological diseases likely entered the central nervous system via these little um, neuro um, olfactory endings from the olfactory bulb, uh, which is just above the nasal vault, and it sends down little rootlets through sleeves, and you have uh, some uh, fairly direct access to the central nervous system by infectious agents and chemicals. Um, through that, um, but infectious agents may uh, have access that way and cause all kinds of long-term effects. Now it's kind of not very much time left, so I'm going to do basically a flyover. I tend to think globally, or I enjoy thinking globally, and I want to just say in terms of um, changes in medical technology, um, uh, that are striking. Uh, there's there's always been uh, a kind of a conflict at times, or at least uh, hopefully a balance between what are called lumpers and splitters. Uh, lumpers are people that just uh, uh, kind of see things generally, and um, often it has seemed to me that these are the people that say, I trust my gut, and that sort of thing. Uh, and the splitters, the people that look for more and more detail and sometimes get buried in it. Um, but the um, with some balance, uh, I think one of the biggest achievements of modern medicine has been increased precision in most everything it does. That includes diagnostics and imaging uh, for primary diagnosis and also for monitoring of uh, disease and the effects of treatment. And um, another example of increased precision is the development of minimally invasive surgery. Uh, I wrote out some ideas here on a, uh, you can't see it, but it's a napkin. And I did that because I was originally a mathematician. But uh, one of the things I wanted to discuss quickly uh, that I've seen develop in my career is cochlear uh, implant surgery. Um, if you go back to the 30s and 40s, you had operating microscopes. I actually have one of the first 
um, operating microscopes ever used in the state of Ohio. It was being thrown out it's on a big, heavy iron base, and I've dragged it around with me for years. Um, it's a it's a field or micro or um, basically a field microscope, but use of microscopy for seeing what you're doing when you're drilling out the ear. Uh, originally, if people had uh, subperiosteal abs abscess or mastoiditis, acute mastoiditis from uh, um, uh, uh, perulent uh, um, or pus forming uh, bacterium that got in the middle ear and caused uh, um, osteitis like that, uh, it could cause meningitis and they used to basically do incision and drainage. And sometimes they had uh, facial nerve injuries and other things, but uh, a lot of people had uh, uh, um, histories of mastoid, ide uh, mastoid operations, but they were basically pretty primitive. Uh, the uh, uh, whole thing progressed uh, using high quality uh, uh, optics to do uh, uh, middle ear surgery and mastoid surgery and taking out the stapes, which is about five millimeters tall. I, I've done many stapedectomies in my ears and um, it gets fixed in place. It's one of the three ossicles that transmits sound to the inner ear and uh, who can remove it. Um, some people um, uh, do this by um, lasering a hole into the foot plate of the, of the stirrup bone stapes. Uh, I, I just removed it um, uh, mechanically and I always did well with that, uh, with tenth of a millimeter right angle picks. Uh, it's kind of a small field. Um, tenth of a millimeter? Rate, Holy tenth moly. Tenth of a millimeter, yes. Um, See, the, the tools the, involved um, in this are just so tiny, it's amazing. You know, the, the stapes is about five millimeters tall. The length of the cochlea is between eight and nine millimeters. The length of the inner ear, if you unrolled it, it's kind of in a two and a third roll. Uh, turns uh, like a, a, a shell, but um, uh, at any rate, that was sort of primitive compared to the combination of interdisciplinary combination of technology that's used now in a cochlear implant. It, that, that fixed a mechanical problem. Mechanical pro well, it, it became a sensory neural loss and eventually because the process that caused the bone to get fixed in place, the otospongiosis that evolves into otosclerosis, uh, became toxic to the uh, um, inner ear and damaged the uh, sensory neural apparatus. Um, so, um, uh, eventually, people would have inner ear type loss as, as well, but you could get people up to essentially normal hearing uh, by doing this, and it would last for decades. And uh, as they got older, sometimes they had uh, aging effects, presbyacusis, and it would worsen uh, maybe uh, more profoundly because of continued otospongiosis type changes. Um, I mentioned in one of the science groups discussion that people had tried using fluoride treatments to arrest otospongiosis, but you can get fluoridosis of the bones and uh, untoward changes like that. But I want to trans transition from that to talking about the cochlear implants. They began when I was early in my career and they were one channel implants, basically um, uh, uh, something to stimulate the uh, auditory nerve. And it uh, was a habitual to say sensory neural loss. It really made it uh, sensible to discuss sensory loss versus neural loss. If you have neural loss, loss of fibers in the um, uh, acoustic nerve, as you can get with acoustic neuroma, for instance, you have decrease in your ability to discriminate or unscramble complex sound and interpret what you hear. You might be aware of a sound, but you can't make any sense of it. Um, if you just have hair cell loss um, in the, uh, under the tectoral membrane, you know, um, uh, 
uh, business end that transduces uh, uh, the um, vibrations into neural impulses. You lose those, you can have tinnitus and hearing loss, but if you can stimulate the auditory nerve directly by putting an electrode into the scale of tympani, which is this, you have this um, oval window where the stapes bone fits and a round window, which is kind of like the a hydraulic system. You can insert um, an electrode through that, or you can drill a little hole into this, uh, through the, co uh, the otic capsule into the scale of tympani and insert an electrode through there. Um, that's come a long ways. Uh, it gave people who had nothing, at least the um, um, uh, perception of sound. Uh, I'm not sure if I would have done it uh, versus having a cat or a dog that responds, and you could see the dog respond, the noise. So, you know, that's pretty practical, expensive, and uh, biological way of dealing with it. Um, it's now up to 16 channels or 22 channel uh, type um, electrodes where basically you implant under the skin of the uh, scalp above the ear um, a receptor. You have a, um, a pickup, a microphone, and a processor that uh, goes up um, behind the ear and uh, over the skin of the implant and can send signals to it and send um, uh, frequency specific uh, signals to uh, various channels. Now it may not be tuned quite right. Uh, people, they uh, actually do pretty well with speech considering, but uh, music's not so great. Um, and you think of music if they, uh, and somebody, sometimes I've known people with perfect pitch who are really bothered when people play off tune um, or tune their instruments without tuning it to uh, standard tuning. Um, but uh, uh, perception of music, recognizing if a frequency goes up or down, things like this are difficult for people with these cochlear implants, but they are really getting way better in just one generation. I think it's really remarkable. Um, really running out of time. To, shall I go on? It's almost. E, well, yeah, sure. Um, I, th I think it's okay if we go a little long. Is that okay, Chantal? I won't go 30 minutes. I'll just, I'll try to hit a couple big points. Okay, I think that's okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I always tend to over go over. But um, at any rate, um, uh, I um, also uh, was, uh, I wanted to mention this about the cochlear implants. I, I, with, and I'm not an ophthalmologist. And since 1960, ophthalmology and otolaryngology have been separate to disciplines. But in ophthalmology, uh, certainly uh, LASIK surgery is similar in my thinking to stapedectomy, except it's really quick. You can do it in eight minutes with a, raise a, a flap on the cornea and do a, a laser contouring of the uh, underlying cornea and lay the flap back down. And uh, then the next day, take off the bandages and people will have normal or nearly normal vision. It's really quite remarkable. And uh, it's it's something to it's it's quite doable. At, at at any rate, there's been all kinds of advances in in various disciplines. I'm going to kind of focus on otolaryngology, which was my field. Um, endoscopy uh, or or visualization because of um, fiber optics. You know, the Romans. I was reading about this. The Romans used glass. They drew out in rods and noted that glass could transmit light. And um, oh, like 1930s, uh, Heinrich Lamm, L-A-M-M, -M, uh, uh, used a, a, a bundle of a fiber rods and used them for internal examinations, internal medical examinations. And um, his work was pretty much forgotten uh, or um, 
maybe ahead of its time and probably World War II didn't help. Um, uh, this, of course, uh, transmission of light into a, a lumen or into a field, surgical field by fiber optics was quite useful. Um, one other aspect of this, having light sources, like high powered halogen light sources, that if you look directly at it, you will burn a hole in your retina, but uh, that will allow you to have enough light transmitted through this tiny port, which is essentially what these fiber optic uh, systems are, um, makes, makes it possible to have really stunning visualization inside the nasal cavity and the pharynx and the esophagus throughout the GI tract. And this, um, I, I, I should point out also 1965, uh, a attenuation of the loss of uh, light energy uh, was uh, made possible by doping the silica glass with titanium. Uh, titanium is right after scandium. Uh, so that's 22, uh, atomic number 22, and we think of it as part of steel, uh, but uh, this kind of goes along with the development of the semiconductor industry. They've doped glass with fluorine and uh, various um, elements in the nitrogen group and uh, gallium, of course, and other things. But another big advance engineering-wise that, that was stunning was before 1983, it, they could only produce two meters per second of um, an uh, optical fiber. Um, 1983, and the engineering process was uh, innovatively changed so they could suddenly produce 50 meters per second uh, fiber optic uh, um, cable, or, or not cable, but uh, fiber optic uh, rod. And uh, that became competitive and faster, really, than producing a copper uh, wire. Um, so that um, fiber optics became competitive in terms of communications with uh, uh, just conductors. Well, anyway, back to medicine. Um, it was in the uh, 1980s when uh, the use of rigid uh, endoscopes were really starting to be used for uh, um, nasal cavity surgery, working on the maxillary sinus or the ethmoid sinuses or frontal sinus even, which is really, um, it's the access to that's more difficult. Um, and I could fix it so you could have 30 degrees, 45 degree angle looking up. And uh, you had to really know your anatomy and their before this, they had people doing intranasal ethmoidectomies and um, having blindness as a post-operative complication was not uh, particularly un uh, un uh, unusual. Um, anytime you have nasal cavity surgery, you can have injury to the eye and the vision or injury to the skull base and have uh, the brain injured or uh, vascularity of the brain damaged or uh, leak of cerebral spinal fluid. Um, one of the things uh, that's a com combinations of uh, technology, they're now uh, making it so that you can make um, uh, high resolution CT scans and have um, markers so that um, the scope, the uh, the the equipment knows where the tip of the scope is, and you can look at a monitor and see where your scope is with relationship to the orbit, which is where the eyeball is, or the skull base and the, and the brain above. There's a horrendous historic picture, and I don't know exactly who was to account for it, and it may have been staged uh, for all I know, but it was um, scary of, um, endoscopic sinus surgery that the idea was it was stopped in the middle of the surgery and a, and a lateral x-ray was made of the head and the endoscope was up in the brain. Um, when you've got a nasal cavity full of polyps and disease, it can be difficult to tell it, it like mush and it bleeds. Well, that's all better controlled. Uh, the changes from making incisions in the face 
down the, along the nose or uh, a flipping a flap down off the forehead to bring down uh, the end and cutting through the anterior table, the frontal sinuses, or going up under the lip like a Caldwell Luck procedure, lifting the lip up and stripping the um, periosteum and, and superficial tissues off the anterior table of the maxillary sinus and knowing to stop before you hit the infraorbital nerve so you wouldn't have numbness of the whole cheek and upper lip. Um, and you would enter, tap with a, a chisel and enter the sinus and uh, scrape it out. And um, with this end, end, endoscopy, you could um, improve the drainage systems of these sinuses from within and leave the mucosa to recover and have its natural function. It's it's an example of minimally invasive surgery. Another example of that is um, like parathyroid surgery. Used to be, I did a lot of thyroid surgery actually, and I didn't do so much parathyroid. I would prefer those elsewhere, but uh, I did. I had to deal with parathyroids because um, you try to identify them so that you don't remove them when you total thyroidectomy. Uh, that was one of the hardest things I had to do in my surgical practice, identify these little clumps of brownish tissue. There are four of them normally. And sometimes they're embedded in the thyroid gland. And thyroid glands you're removing, they have cancer in it. Um, so if you do remove it, you try to uh, take it and mince it, and you can implant it uh, subcutaneously. But there is a. Um, Again, a number, of, a combination of technologies, and this goes back to Seaborg. Seaborg, I think, is um, had a element 106 named after him, Seaborgium. He was a um, physicist in California. He was uh, responsible for about uh, discovery of about 12 synthetic elements, but um, he used a cyclotron. Lawrence, who has um, element 103 named after him. Uh, invented the cyclotron, and he used the cyclotron with molybdium, which has um, uh, atomic number uh, 40, uh, let's say 42, 42 um, and um, bombarded that with protons and created technetium uh, M99. Um, the M means metastable. It's, a, it's an, uh, a nuclear isomer of technetium-99. And uh, molybdenum, uh, it, it, it becomes molybdenum-99, uh, uh, becomes technetium-M99. 90, molybdenum-99 has a half-life of about two and a half days, 65 hours. And um, it has, um, I think, a beta decay. And, uh, uh, becomes uh, in a beta decay, the one of the uh, um, uh, neutrons uh, becomes a proton and emits uh, an uh, electron. And so it becomes the next heavier element, technetium, uh, which has atomic weight of uh, atomic number of uh, uh, 43. And the technetium 99M has a half life of about six and a half hours. So you can produce with a cyclotron molybdenum uh, to 99 to technetium 99M and transport that. And then you combine it with uh, in what's called uh, technetium M99 sestamibi. Sesta means six and mibi is, uh, stands for ethyl isobutyl isonitrite um, or nitrate. Um, uh, in, in these, it's a ligands, these six uh, molecules associated with the element. And uh, yeah, I think I, I, I was trying to say that, um, Sergey, that uh, it, it was a beta decay process. Uh, but at any rate, um, there's hardly any technetium in the soil. Of, in the crust of the earth. Uh, it was one of the gaps in Mendeleev's uh, um, 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 a periodic table, and uh, it's easier to uh, uh, produce by um, nuclear synthesis. So, at any rate, the, um, the technetium M99 decays uh, and um, forms 
technetium-99, which will later decay, uh, also a beta decay to the next heavier element, um, which is uh, uh, ethereum uh, RU, um, I don't know if it's 99 or not. Uh, at any rate, um, to Rutherium. Um, so the, it's the most used uh, radioisotope in medicine. Uh, yeah, the atomic uh, number, uh, the atomic weight uh, for um, Rutherium, I think, is uh, on average around 101. Um, uh, right, and, and it's a beta decay by with ruthenium, uh, uh, ruthenium, I guess, RU is the uh, symbol. Ruthenium, I'm mispronouncing it. Uh, ruthenium is uh, produced by beta decay as well. Um, it's atomic number 44. At any rate, this uh, technetium 99M can be used to it's, a, it's useful in doing uh, um, scans for the heart, um, also some with breast uh, disease, but also for parathyroids. Excessive activity of parathyroid glands takes up uh, this um, uh, technetium 99M systemibi. And so you can have minimal uh, minimally invasive surgery of thyroids. Instead of making a big long incision across the neck, a collar incision, you make several small incisions and you can use endoscopes and special um, instruments to do your uh, dissection. And you have a gamma probe that is sterile, used in the surgical field. It has to be done within two hours of the injection. Um, and the surgery can take one or two hours, but it uh, can be pretty fast. And some places, people go home the same day. Uh, so I, the, I, isotope, the isotope helps visualize uh, yeah, the use thyroid tissue? Uh, you know, so the, M, uh, the technetium uh, 99M is a gamma emitter. And um, so you have a gamma probe. And as you're dissecting, and you can put your probe up in there, and you can see if you're getting close to your parathyroids, where okay. they are difficult as hell to find uh, half the time or more. And so um, it's turned uh, uh, kind of a, a beautiful surgery, but it's uh, a difficult surgery. It can be botched up if you're not good at it. Um, and... Uh, it's one of those things you need to do a certain amount to be able to do well. Uh, but it's <laughs> improved uh, the precision of uh, um, doing this. One other aspect about this doing minimally invasive surgery is robotics. I've had to stand on my head and do all kinds of uh, interesting incisions in the neck to be able to get to base of tongue, the back third of the tongue and uh, lateral pharynx or the hypopharynx, um, you can do um, 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 uh, robotic surgery uh, in the pharynx or in the, uh, uh, on the larynx. And I have people I have not, uh, I went for years. I think that with the rise in obesity, I, I had some people I just couldn't get direct line of sight with uh, the standard um, traditional laryngoscopes. Um, to visualize the larynx, to remove things from the larynx and the vocal cords. And with these um, uh, robotics, particularly, you can get to anywhere, just about. Uh, there's one, I go to Tumor Board regularly, uh, which is multidisciplinary, and uh, there's a uh, urologist who does lots of um, robotic surgery on uh, um, removing uh, kidney. Uh, um, malignancies and uh, um, um, even prostate uh, uh, tumors can be removed uh, with uh, robotic surgery. So robotics is a big move forward. Also just employ lasers and being able to um, ablate or destroy tissue that you want to get rid of. Right. Finally, one real <clears throat> quick. 
All right, last Pathology. one. Pathology. Pa yeah, last one, and then I'll, I'll shut up. Pathology is just, it's marvelous what's happened. You think back, the organic dyes developed and develop of high quality microscopes and basic optics, and you had Koch and others that were able to develop um, a, a good quality scientific pathology to identify tissue. That's one of the problems in medicine is uh, that, that it had for a long time is they didn't know what they were dealing with and they really couldn't see it. They didn't have a well-defined uh, cell theory. But anyway, it got into identifying tissue and abnormal tissue or including tumors by um, morphologic micro, microscopic change, um, pathological examination under a microscope. Now this evolved, um, and I'm just going to give this in a kind of a nutshell, uh, immunohistochemistry, or IHC, IHC is a common term, it goes back to 1941, a guy named Albert Kuhns um, used um, ways of, um, of the uh, um, antigens, uh, particularly in cell surfaces, but they can be inside the cells as well, depending, and you can have ways of making the uh, antibodies that you use to detect the presence of certain antigens um, to um, light up uh, or become visible in various um, uh, kinds of light and some variations on some of these things like flow cytometry. But at any rate, immunohistochemistry yeah. was a big advance, and that's gone beyond now so that you have a whole new field developing called molecular pathology, which looks not so much at cell morphology, but at molecules in a cell that define its behavior. And that is so complex that I, I was talking to the pathologist uh, at the uh, tumor board yesterday morning. Uh, there's a whole uh, sister field to this that they're dependent on, uh, basically referred to as informatics, which uh, uh. can't be very surprising. The database for all this is so vast and it's changing so quickly that no one can keep up with it. And by uh, being able to input your problem with um, an uh, a system, artificial intelligence sort of system that yeah, will that's what sort I was just out. thinking. Yeah, you uh, need AI for that. Yeah, you can come up with great diagnoses, and this is kind of uh, graduating from what used to be traditional. You'd have protocols for treatment of a certain disease presentation, which would be multi uh, or multi institutional, because no one had enough of patients that had hypopharyngeal cancer of a certain type and um, you have like 10 major medical centers and you could have enough patients to be able to conclude if one treatment was yeah. better or not. But this uh, can go to a much vaster database and it can keep up much quicker. And let's see, I'm looking at my napkin here. Well, oh. nope, I, I think we're out of time. <laughs> okay. I, I have one, that. one comment do... about coronavirus. I right, make they, it quick. You know, All right. Okay. They, well, it's, it's an <laughs> RNA virus. I um, I'd mentioned before type four. And um, when I pre presented on coronavirus, they uh, generally for active disease, you would use a reverse uh, transcriptase uh, PCR polymerase chain reaction test and. The uh, United States, I, I'm not sure why, except everything is being politicized in the United States now and um, have all this America first, uh, uh, America uber alles kind of mentality. Uh, so that instead of using WHO guidelines and uh, well-developed tests, they decided to develop their own and it didn't work. And they... Um, uh, and, and on the 14th of February, they announced they were going to do surveillance in New York, Chicago, L.A., San Francisco, and Se Seattle. That has not started yet. And um, right now, only the CDC and Illinois, Idaho, Tennessee, California, Nevada, and Nebraska um, 
are able to do any tests and they've got so few of these test kits. The test kits have about six or seven hundred tests that can be done with one um, with so, each kit. Uh, yeah, are so, the are the diagnostic tests still like uh, RNA based? I mean, it seems like it yes. would be a lot cheaper and faster if we could develop an antibody test for that's the corona. What, what's the hold up after... with that? Well, um, that's only useful after it, it, um, you have uh, an immune response that's developed. If you have naive patients oh. who are infected, uh, but don't right, have they're an asymptomatic, immune response, right, 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 right. That was a, a similar up. problem with AIDS, where they it wasn't generating antibodies until it was too late. Yeah, right, so you get right. uh, acute and convalescent samples, and you see a rise in antibodies, and that's. Uh, evidentiary proof of uh, a recent infection of okay. whatever you're looking at. But at any rate, this has really been handled poorly, I'm afraid. And uh, this well, is a matter of life and death, and it, that people should speak plainly about it. Yeah. Were you, uh, was it you that mentioned the other day that some of these kits sent out by the CDC had a defective component, so they had to have sort of a recall? Um, well, this seems to me like a symptom of the fact that the CDC budget was cut and they and they lost a lot, you know, they fired a lot of the personnel. And basically, you know, the agency uh, was just caught flat footed and just could not ramp up fast enough. So they got sloppy. That's true. And uh, yes, they were, they were saying that it was a faulty component. I did all the search I could to find out what that faulty component is. I can't find any information printed so that, anywhere about it. That probably but, was a lie. <laughs> well, it, it was probably a euphemistic. Uh, right, but the test, the test was not specific, and uh, it also... Um, uh, they had problems about the uh, Drug Enforcement Agency saying that it's got to be more specific and accurate and this kind of thing as though it were something that were going to be marketed rather than something being used for an emergency. Oh, and brother. so uh, the, one of the problems is the team, all the positions that handled the Ebola crisis uh, in um, 2009, I think, um, have been defunded because, you know, that was this uh, terrible previous president, so we don't want anything that he did. So, yeah, and we it, don't want to hear anything from scientists. The great so, purge. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, muzzling scientists, it's quite a dangerous thing. So, yeah. I hope people will speak out. Well, on that cheerful said, note, uh, yeah, okay, very good. Uh, I'm just going to throw in a couple of thoughts, which is I uh, am curious to see whether nanobots, uh, nanites, will ever be developed for sort of micro-robotic surgeries or interventions, and also whether the use of, I think already there's some English of this, but whether virtual reality will play a role also in uh, sort of medical devices and surgeries and visualizations and so forth. Um, I'm not quite sure what advantages virtual reality would bring, um, but it does seem like a way that perhaps you could uh, um, uh, maybe uh, finely control um, uh, surgical little tiny micro tools or something like that. But I just wanted to mention nanobots and virtual reality. Um, uh, and I guess uh, just to, we should just wrap this up quickly. And I want to once again thank Chantal and Jess. I want to thank my panelists, um, uh, Robert uh, and Stephen, uh, for their preparation uh, for this topic. Really appreciate the work you guys put into getting ready for these discussions. And I also want to um, uh, thank the Science Circle for hosting us. Uh, and for, of course, all of our uh, students who attend. Thank you all, and have a great week. Thank you, Baragon. Yeah, Thank thanks you, for Stephen. And thanks for everyone for coming. Thank you, Stephen. That was a very nice presentation. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.